it was really lonely for me because I was not making friends and... It was an absolute chaos. No one could understand me. No, no one. Communication is a basic skill we develop as children and this is taken for granted. But what happens when a child does not pick the skill up automatically and finds it hard to communicate and understand the world around them? This is called Developmental Language Disorder, DLD. This is something that I'm living with. DLD is not widely known or understood. Just because a child or a person looks the same as the person next to them, society doesn't understand that that particular child may have difficulty with communication or understand speech and language. This impacts one out of 10 children. This makes it difficult to learn through reading, writing, and to communicate as easily as others. It's not a visible challenge, it's a hidden disorder. When I was seven years old, it was difficult for me, but I didn't realize why I found things hard. As I got older, I began to recognize that I was different from others and it had a big impact on the way I interacted and lived my life. I started to go into a shell. I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be labeled and I didn't want to stand out from others. I wanted the same life experiences that others were enjoying. Every time my difficulty was brought up, I felt embarrassed and I tried to run and hide from it. The reason I've been running from this condition is because I always found it hard and depressing to talk about it, even though I didn't properly understand what I found difficult. So I decided to go on a journey back to my old school, Morehouse School, a specialist residential school for people with learning difficulties, like me, to learn about DLD and to get some answers. The only way I can describe it is though you were a little boy who did not understand the world around him. I think, looking back, we always knew you had a, a problem of some sorts, but we didn't quite know what it was. I mean, you were our first-born child, so we just thought everything was normal. This was how children, you know, acted. Morehouse is exceptionally fortunate in that we are able to offer speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, specialist literacy intervention, integrated into our teaching curriculum. And this helps all the children who come to us um, and addresses the needs that they have in the areas of speech and language therapy and occupational therapy and also issues they might have around acquiring literacy skills. And it's allowed the children and young people to be able to access learning in a field of their choice and then to go on to, to do things that they wanted to do um, with their lives after that. And thereby to fulfil the mission of the school, which is really to make sure that the young people who leave here are as independent and um, contributing members of society as possible. So to have word finding is basically like a cupboard in your brain that most people have organised. Yep. But for me, it's a very messy cupboard and it's all over the place. That's exactly right. You've explained that really, really well. So we're working on word finding mm -hmm. and word finding is when they say it's that tip of the tongue phenomenon, when you know what that word is, but you just can't think of it, and it gets When you have a diagnosis of DLD, learning vocabulary doesn't come naturally like it does for other people. You need to be taught words explicitly and taught what they mean, how to use them, and even how to pronounce them, and how to put them into sentences as well. So the first thing you do when you've got word finding difficulties, when you can't think of that word... Matthew and I were working on word finding. Word finding difficulties are when you know exactly what the word is, but you just can't get that word out. And we call that the tip of the tongue phenomenon. A lot of people have this difficulty, but it is a unfortunate part of having a developmental language disorder is it's very common that you've got word finding difficulties and my role is to help the students not have that struggle. So what Matt and I were doing is we were doing a approach to teaching word finding where you look at your ability to categorise things. As Matt explained in his session, he felt his brain was a really messy filing cabinet with lots of bits and papers everywhere and that's why he can't ever get those words and being able to put things into categories helps to kind of organise that filing cabinet so you can pick that word that you want more easily. Uh, it's 
it's cool. Have you? Yeah. They've Ask taught me how to remember words, like how to talk to people, uh, like understanding like complex words in, and they've made it in an easier way so that I can understand and it. it's made my school life much more capable for me to work in. Uh, pedal, um, pedal boats. Yes. Fantastic work. It wasn't Brilliant. until the age of three that we started to investigate it more. You know, other children were saying mama and dada and we didn't get anything. One day I decided to speak to the nursery and say to them that would you keep an eye on him because something doesn't seem right. And unbeknown to me they'd already been keeping an eye on you for some time. And they'd had a chat with me and said that maybe I should go to the doctors with you because they were concerned as well. So I went off to the doctors and I remember it distinctively going in there one day with you in my arms and saying, you know, he doesn't speak and I don't quite know what I'm going to do and what do you think we should do? And the doctor saying to me, don't worry, he'll, he'll speak eventually, don't worry, he's going to be fine. And then um, I remember I called your name. Um, I'd called it before, but this time I'd called it while you were playing with toys. And um, I said, Ryan, and you didn't respond. And then I said, Ryan, do you want to come to the park? And you didn't even turn around. And I, then I knew something wasn't right because usually children will jump up and run and get their coat as quickly as possible to get to the park. Uh, yep. Oh. Mm -hmm. mm. Season. Uh, Excellent. All right, so we know now a deciduous tree mm -hmm. is a tree that loses its leaves every year. Yep. Okay. Like every student with DLD, no one person presents the same. The area of impairment and the area of need and support that they require really does vary. So with John being in college, we were teaching vocabulary specific to his agriculture course and teaching him what the words meant and then how he can actually put them into practice when he's on the farm communicating with other farmers or also within his written assignments um, and just preparing him for life on the farm. Um, we, we know about trees that they, that they can live and uh, live that they can go green at summer, then go orange at winter. So what we've done is a vocabulary word map where John was required to write down the word that I was teaching him and then we needed to together look at what that word meant, practice how you would use it in a sentence and look at how the word could possibly change to be used in maybe a different tense or in a different context. We also drew a diagram which supports John in linking that word to its actual meaning by having a visual representation. And then because John does have some literacy difficulties as well, we went through the word property. So what's the first sound in that word? How many syllables does it have? Um, is it containing long or short vowels? So for someone like John, in order to teach one single word, he would need to hear it, write down its meaning, learn how to use it in a sentence, practice it in conversation, learn how it could be used in different contexts, and then a visual representation for that as well. And we call that multi-sensory learning. D, C, D, C, D, C, D, Well done, excellent work. Beat therapy to me is, is, is like really important. Um, because it like helped me with everyday talking and communication skills because when I first came here no one could understand me. No no one. So we saw a speech and language therapist and I remember them testing you one day with lots of objects on the table. They would say like, Ryan, can you give me the cup? Or can you give me the tea towel? Or can you give me the brush? And you couldn't give them anything. You just didn't understand what was being asked of you. And I use the word understand because the speech and language therapist was a person who said to me, he does not understand what is being said to him. So she suggested a different nursery where they could observe you. And it took us a year of speech and language therapists, clinical and educational psychologists observations, looking at you to see where the problem lies, what they can do to help.
I have one last question, and I'm a little bit nervous asking this question, but what did I used to find difficult? Uh, if I'm if I'm honest, yeah. Yeah. You found a lot of things really difficult, Ryan. Yeah. I suppose I properly met you in year ten. Is that right? Yeah. yeah? You and I began working together. Um, a key thing for you, Ryan, was probably then your confidence and you really wanted to formulate certain friendships and I think you'd had a knock of confidence probably um, before then about trying to work out your group of friends. So we did quite a lot of work, you and I, on self-awareness. So that was working out who Ryan was, yeah, where his strengths were, where your difficulties were and how we could use your strengths to help those difficulties improve. Yes, we did a lot of work around you understanding what it was to have a language impairment and why that language impairment meant that you found these other things a bit harder. Um, I have some very clear memories of you, age seven, but it was a very long time ago. Um, you were a very quiet little boy, very shy, very nervous. Um, you got easily upset by things that you didn't understand and things that we knew, and quite often when you felt like that you would hide under a table. So I spent quite a few hours um, with you under a table trying to coax you out to make you feel um, more confident. You were quite easily upset by change and new things and new routines and that did quite make it quite difficult for you to make friends initially when you joined us. You and I did a lot of work on learning how to formulate sentences, particularly as you went through the college getting them into essays. And I remember sitting with you doing GCSE English trying to get all of those ideas that you had down onto paper and also helping you understand the information that you read and trying to turn that into your own words to answer those English GCSA questions. Back in my old school it was an absolute chaos. What they did was they didn't teach you anything, they just gave us these booklets. It was a level from one to eight. Sometimes when I get through one I get it checked and all of a sudden all the questions are incorrect. It like really frustrated me because I didn't learn anything. I was always getting into trouble and it wasn't just because of me just being really naughty. It was just that I just didn't understand anything. I wasn't learning. Because I wasn't learning anything, I was sort of mucking around. Because I know sometimes, John, it is really hard to remember what all of these words yeah. mean. So the more practice you do, the better you'll become yeah. at it. All right, so let's summarise. Before I came to Morehouse School was a bit annoying and a bit, humili a bit humiliated. Oh, I know that story. I the school where I go to didn't you? really tell me what I had got. The bit oh, where I found I difficult was to make friends Have you seen it? because to me, <laughs> when I was younger, before I came here, I thought they were friends, but they turned out not to be friends, so they don't intending to be friends with me, to like bully me a lot and all right. that. Okay. I'm making fun of my speech. Can you tell me what your favourite thing is at school? What is your favourite thing? Showing lunch. Which one? Showing lunch. So, let's have a think before we start. We're doing science words. Why are we working on those? Because science words are very difficult. They are difficult. What is it about them that makes them difficult? Because um, they're very long words. Often they're very long, aren't they? Yeah, they've got lots Speech of... Speech therapy is very important lots for of me. Syllables. Because and also they're often very it, it would help me similar. in the wider word now. And now I can understand people that had the um, same thing that I had. I can, un I can make sure they know me and I can talk to them more comfortably. And why are the arrows all going towards it? Because it gives in the heat. 
It doesn't give it in, it takes it. It takes it. With Harry, it's really important that everything I do is based on his visual strengths. So Harry, for language processing, is really, really difficult. But he has strengths with looking and understanding through what he can see. What I was using was a combination of words, pictures, but also shape coding, which is such an important part for Harry. When we learn words, we have to learn how to say it. We have to learn about the sounds in the words. We have to learn about its meanings. And for often for words, there are multiple meanings. But we also have to learn how to use that word in a sentence. And for Harry, that's the bit that's really, really important. So I'm not just teaching him how to say a word, I'm showing him and giving him repeated practice heat how to use it in a sentence. Absorbed. So heat is taken in and chemical bonds are broken. broken. I remember when, before I went to Morehouse School, I was in a school for dis disabled people. It made me feel really, really disturbed and depressed because it was not a nice feeling to be in that school because people didn't understand me and it was really, really hard to understand them as well and it made me feel like I needed some help and luckily my dad was behind me for all, for all of this and now I'm in a lovely school with help from speech and language therapists and OT and it helps me a lot now and it's really, really, really good. I think that a lot of children who come to us have had very difficult times in their previous placement. They may have been bullied, they may not have thrived educationally and therefore have low self-esteem. Because developmental language disorder is a condition that doesn't go away, it will be with the young people for the rest of their lives. Often when they get to their teenage years, it might come as something which is quite difficult to to understand that these problems won't go away and I think at that point you could have concerns around good mental health so it's really important for us here to provide an, in, an environment that is really focused on student well-being and on good mental health. What's your favourite thing to do when you go to school? When I go to school mm -hmm. I'll play the safari. Before I was diagnosed with DLD, what was your vision for me? Well, I wanted to be a Oh, before you were diagnosed with the developmental language disorder, oh my God. Um, um, that, that, was, that was just something different completely. Um, we, had, um, we, uh, we just had everything planned out. When we were told you had DLD, it was devastating. It was frightening and very emotional and scary. When we were feeling at our lowest, my friend sent us a poem that helps describe what it feels like to have a child with a disability. It goes something like this. We found out we were going to have a baby. It was so exciting. It's like planning a fabulous vacation to somewhere you've always wanted to go, say Italy. So you plan a trip to Rome you buy the guidebooks, you look forward to seeing the Vatican, the Colosseum, Trevi Fountain, eating pizza, ice cream and drinking wine. The day arrives and you pack your bags and off you go. After a few hours, you land and step off the plane to find out that you've landed in Holland. Holland, sorry, we should not be in Holland, we signed up for Italy. And then we're told, we're sorry, but there's been a flight change and this is where you need to stay. After you calm down, you realise that Holland is not such a bad place. It's not as racy and as glitzy as Italy, but it's nice. It has windmills, canals, tulips, Rembrandts. It's okay, it's just different. But your friends are busy going backwards and forwards to Italy and telling you how great it is in Italy. And you will always think to yourself, that was my vacation, that's where I was supposed to go, that was my destination. And you'll never forget that and that hurt never goes away. But if you keep worrying about what could have been in Italy, you'll never realise how wonderful Holland can be and what Holland has to offer. Looking back over the past 20 years, you have grown from a child who didn't recognise us as mummy and daddy when you were three. And now, as I think about all the things you've done and the things you've experienced and the things that you've achieved, they're unbelievable. If someone had said to us when you were seven that you would be in the place you are now, 
We would never have believed it. It's been a difficult and painful period, but there are no prouder parents in the world than Dad and I. You have grown to be a thoughtful and caring young man, one that we are proud to call you our son. I initially didn't want to make this documentary. This was a subject I tried to keep hidden. It was too close to home, and I found it hard to talk about it. And I didn't want to bring it to the forefront of everyone's mind that I had a difficulty, because this was a hidden disorder. My fear was making mistakes, not understanding what people would say, the infants would choke, or sometimes instructions or communication. My fear was not fitting in. But going back to Morehouse School opened my eyes and allowed me to see myself through the stories of Matt, John and Harry. I have learned that perhaps the world isn't very tolerant and that I can't change who I am. I'm the person who has this difficulty and it will be with me for the rest of my life. But I've learned that from this whole journey, from, from the initial idea to now, is that it is okay to talk about these things instead of running from it, like I did in the past. Talking about it has helped me realise how far I've come. A film such as this perhaps still doesn't capture the rawness of my feelings and emotions but it has helped me soothe the path. Ryan Khalifa, 